pleasure of calling upon Rear Admiral Mark McDonald, the Commander of Maritime Forces Pacific, uh, your host when we went to sea uh, yesterday, and also the Joint Force Commander responsible for search and rescue for military operations and Air Force activities here uh, in BC and the Yukon. Admiral McDonald, please. Um, I need to, uh, to bolster the remarks that he made 
and, and, and let you know that uh, Admiral Boyd is a keen student of sea power, perhaps because uh, he benefited from all the tutelage that uh, Jim McKillia had provided through the years. Uh, Admiral Boyd is particularly attentive to developments in the Indo-Pacific region, and as I will note later in my remarks, his interest and his commitment in the region is reflected in a series of naval deployments uh, that will be the centerpiece of our Maritime Forces Pacific upcoming team schedule. As we've gotten to know one another, we've come to agree that this conference is an incredible forum, one that brings together a deeply impressive array of maritime experts to describe and debate the dynamics of Pacific sea power. And arguably, there's never been a more appropriate time for that debate and that dialogue. Now, before I get into that theme in a little bit more detail, before I proceed any further, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank our host, the Navy League of Canada, a national organization that does superb work with naval cadets and, as well, through its maritime affairs program. I'm delighted that the League is represented here today by my old shipmate, mentor, Harry Harsh. Great to have you here, Harry, for so many reasons. And uh, wonderful that the Navy League has been such an active and helpful partner for all of this for those seven years. I'd also like to extend a particular thanks to the Daniel Gay Nui Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, uh, of which I count myself part of the alumni. APCSS has been a warm, enthusiastic, and indefatigable supporter of the MSC conference series, and I'm very pleased to have the Center's Deputy Director, uh, Brigadier General Jim Bry, U.S. Army retired, with us here today. I'd also be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank the organizations that make this all possible. Our sponsors, let's look at into the crowd, having come from my previous job as a Naval Force Development in Ottawa, having had the pleasure to work with industry partners who are just as seized with ensuring that Canada's Navy is capable of being an active and uh, successful partner in the world. Uh, I see them all here again today, and I'm, I'm heartened by that. Just to name uh, the sponsors, I want to recognize certainly Talus, Atlas Electronic Canada, General Dynamics Mission Systems Canada, L3 Communications. Maps Incorporated, Raytheon Canada, Strat 4, as Jim mentioned, who sponsored the breakfast this morning, Babcock Canada, Lockheed Martin Canada, and Royal Roads University. Fantastic sponsors with whom support we would not be able to have this conference, and without their support we wouldn't be able to put the Navy that we have to see. Returning to the thrust, oh, sorry, and I should mention as well, of course, the tremendous job by Jim Steen uh, and all of the people working in the background to make this incredibly successful. They've been at it for a long time. They've been very patient in introducing me back uh, to, to this uh, event and ensuring that all of your needs, all of our needs, are collectively uh, taken care of. So ladies and gentlemen, will you just join with me in recognizing them as well for their Thank you for that. Returning to the thrust of this keynote then, May I suggest by way of this MSC 2016 kickoff that this, ladies and gentlemen, is a new oceanic age, and one with a uniquely Pacific flavor. Let's explore that. Not since the great era of exploration of, in the 16th century have oceans played such an important role in global affairs as they do today. Unprecedented levels of commerce move across the world's oceans. Great power politics are being played out at sea, and oceans are central to the health of the planet in the age of profound climate change. What is more, we are on the cusp for the first time in human history of acquiring the ocean, the Arctic. The recent Canadian discovery of the remains of ancient S. Terre, one of Sir John Franklin's ships in the high Arctic, has brought home to us yet again the courage and vision of those who have strove to discover the sea route to Asia. Now, more than a century and a half later, the steady diminution of polar sea ice promises to give the world a new and navigable ocean. But that vast and remote nature of the North represents a unique challenge, and the opening of this marine passage will have a large impact on marine transit and the world more broadly. Franklin's vision presaged a global transition of the most profound sort. The shift in the global center of affairs from Euro-Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific. This phenomenon has unfolded with remarkable speed, and the stellar rise of China is, in many ways, a metaphor for that transition. In response, as we are all well acquainted, there has been an American pivot, or a rebalance, to the Indo-Pacific region, a timely, diplomatic, 
military and economic recognition of global realities. I would suggest that there's been an equally monumental pivot, the realignment of China's axis of interest from the interior of Asia towards the sea. This realignment has entailed a cultural and intellectual revolution in the sense that traditionally the Chinese tended to view the sea as a barrier. The meteoric, meteoric uh, growth of the Chinese economy changed all that. Beijing came to appreciate the supreme importance of the smooth, predictable, and uninterruptible flow of maritime commerce to its continued prosperity. Furthermore, over the past 30 years, China has come to fully appreciate the flexibility, modularity, and authority of sea power. This revolution in national thought has been manifested in the appearance of a powerful blue water navy, the People's Liberation Army Navy. This, coupled with rapid and impressive growth of the Chinese economy, both in size and in sophistication, has fundamentally altered not just the architecture of the region, but of the world. In addition, it has meant that the existing hegemon, the United States, and the aspiring hegemon, China, find themselves sharing the same oceanic realm. Meanwhile, while Russian submarine activity has increased, and we see a return to uh, sort of pre of Russian activity in a variety of the world's socials, submarines are again being acquired elsewhere around the world and in sufficiently large numbers, especially in, in, in the Indian Ocean and the Asian Pacific region. Once seen as a barrier, the seas have now become a global highway as maritime activity continues to increase both on the water and now below. As a result, oceans, which may have once been considered as insulation, are instead serving to connect continents, to connect countries, and to connect people. Further, as author Rose George captured in her book, 90% of Everything, whose premise is simply this, when I look around the room, 90% of the things I see got here in a ship. She observes that approximately 90% of global trade now travels by sea, where, I need not make a point to this audience, navies play a key role in keeping our shipping lanes secure. This new reality, with its competitive dimensions, places a premium on cooperation at sea. Any disturbance to the uninterrupted flow of goods and resources through the oceans needs to be addressed by the world's sea powers as maritime security is about defending interests common to the global community. I cannot stress enough the importance of maritime cooperation, for, uh, especially as many maritime security specialists point to a naval arms race developing in the Indo Pacific region and the existence of several disturbing and even potentially dangerous flashpoints in Asian waters. Tensions have intensified in recent years, fueled by the increase in size and sophistication of regional navies. Dis disputed maritime boundaries and island claims remain the greatest potential source of conflict in, Asia, in the Asian Pacific region. Fortunately, we have an increasing number of examples of regional navies working together as well. Regional naval forms, such as the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, WPNS and the Inter-American Naval Conference have allowed us to make great strides in enhancing maritime security and international cooperation. The anti-piracy patrols off the Horn of Africa are case in point, as is the recent decision by Indonesia and Philippines to, uh, to an inaugural joint anti-piracy patrol in the Sulu Sea. Canada is one of 30 nations that contribute as well to naval assets to combine maritime forces, a naval coalition that promotes security and stability in the international waters of the Middle Eastern regions. This area comprises some of the world's busiest and most important shipping lanes. The work of CTF 151, a task force responsible for disrupting piracy and armed robbery at sea, while engaging regional partners to help protect global maritime commerce and secure freedom of navigation, has been a clear demonstration of what naval coalitions can accomplish. There has not been a successful attack against a large merchant vessel since May 2012, a true testament to the power and effectiveness of multinational cooperation and interoperability uh, to bring about large scale change and to enhance the security of the world's oceans. This is the same reasoning behind the United States 1000 ship Navy concept, utilizing the global <coughs> naval alliance to combat international threats to peace and trade that is also able to respond to humanitarian cries and natural disaster. As the maritime environment becomes increasingly complex, it is these partnerships and cooperation that will allow us to maintain safety and security across our oceans. 
It could be argued that the remarkable prosperity enjoyed by much of East Asia over the past half century was largely due to the rules-based stability underwritten significantly by an American sea power. Of course, it is a cliche to say that such conditions are like oxygen. You don't miss them until they're gone. But a lack of rules invites disorder and even anarchy. And we cannot afford to contemplate such a prospect at a time when global interdependence and interdependence have reached unprecedented levels. This concept of interconnectivity, by the way, is also being utilized when it comes to the Arctic region, where I've noted that international cooperation will play a key role in its security. The Arctic Council is a consensus-based intergovernmental forum that works to promote the environment, social, and economic aspects of sustainable development in the Arctic through six expert working groups. Canada was also one of the key contributors to the form formulation of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and remains steadfast in upholding the rules-based maritime order. This convention has had the effect of safeguarding the interests of coastal states, but has also created some tension by dramatically reducing the area on the high seas where territorial claims overlap. Fortunately, we have mechanisms for resolving these issues. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration is one such mechanism. Its ruling in July of this year with respect to disputes in the South China Sea highlighted the enormous importance of sustaining a rules-based order at sea and striving to resolve outstanding disputes. It is vital that these disputes do not distract us at a time when the competition for resources continues to grow, when fish stocks are under siege, and when the very oceans themselves are beginning to exhibit dangerous signs of stress. The acidification on the oceans is part and parcel of climate change, and experts suggest that Indo the Indo-Pacific region is likely to suffer disproportionately in terms of the frequency and intensity of climate change-related phenomena such as typhoons. This being the case, there will be an ever greater necessity for navies, coast guards, and other maritime agencies in the Indo-Pacific region to work together to be prepared to bring humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to affected populations. The Canadian Armed Forces, of course, has always uh, been ready to answer that call and has regularly employed with our allies to bring expertise to help those affected by uh, natural disasters. Here, for us, of course, I'm talking about ships, but in a larger context for Canada, we're talking as well about the disaster assistance and response team, uh, a fantastic, self-sufficient, scalable military capability ready to deploy quickly to conduct emergency relief and operations for up to 40 days. Recently deployed, as it was, to Nepal. Nepal. When others are in need of help, Nothing is more effective than a multinational coordinated response to bring help to those in need. Another area where we must cooperate together is in search and rescue, as the multinational search for Malaysian Airlines MH370 uh, illustrated. Search and rescue will be particularly challenging, to even mind you, in the Arctic, where distances are vast and the environment is, I can tell you by personal experience, unforgivable. What we are seeing, in fact, is not just a need for regional navies to articulate priorities and policies, but for a multitude of governmental ministries and agencies to coordinate their efforts to achieve greater effect at sea in the realization of Pacific Sea Power. As a maritime nation, Canada has a profound interest and responsibility in ensuring the safety and security of the global maritime environment. Together with our allies, our work contributes to an ocean commons regulated by international and domestic law that is open to use freely and lawfully as we help safeguard the oceans for future generations. To this end, getting through the task that Admiral Lloyd left me, even in my video, uh, I'll speak a little bit about uh, the current state of the RCN as it tries to operate within the context that I just laid out, and then talk a bit as well about the future evolution of the Navy, of which I'm so proud. The RCN has been at the forefront of every Canadian military response to crisis and conflict. We are Canada's first responders what we like to call the force of first resort. Considered from our involvement in the Second World War, uh, where Canada's initial response on declaration was sailing a convoy from Halifax Harbor, a convoy that consisted of ships that had pre-deployed from the harbor down here in a spot prior to the outbreak of the war. To uh, follow on conflicts and actions, the Korean conflict, three ships leaving this harbor on Canada's declaration for intervention. The first Gulf War, the first Canadian response, three ships sailing from Halifax Harbor, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, three ships 
again, these in Halifax Harbor, one of them already internationally deployed, forward deployed, forward generated, and recast immediately to sh as a show of result. And in humanitarian response, in places like Katrina, uh, sorry, New Orleans, uh, when the hurricane uh, Katrina hit, or after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, again, six ships. Our ships have always been ready and have been the first to be put into action when Canada wants to demonstrate a commitment, an interest, and a result. As we look to the future, Canada is committed to increasing our presence in areas that matter now and in the long term. The Royal Canadian Navy has a global footprint, operating successfully around the world, operating in all oceans of the world, often at task group level of strength, three ships or more. As we continue to participate in international missions in support of the government of Canada objectives and strategic interests, we see our sea power at work every day. We are currently in the very final stages of the most important modernization in our history uh, with the Halifax class frigates, modernizing, uh, as you would have seen, in a project that was worth about $4.3 billion, worked on time and on budget, allowing us to deploy uh, modernized ships urgently in response to Aubrey Assurance Canada's actions uh, in support of Ukraine and against uh, potential Russian aggression. Those frigates that we were on yesterday are now going to serve us into the 2030s. As the modernization program comes to an end, the Royal Canadian Navy will now again have the capacity uh, and will reinvigorate our Asia Pacific presence under the principle of generating forward, which is training where we might fight and operate so that we're on station longer in the places where Canada might find us most readily useful immediately when we might have reason to be called upon to meet national tasks. Demonstration of this is the current deployment of HMCS Vancouver, who is currently conducting Western Pacific deployment in 2016, which is aimed at building strong ties between the Royal Canadian Navy and the navies of Asian Pacific countries, while promoting peace and security in the region and showing Canadian resolve to defending and strengthening the rule-based order of a maritime problem. The ship, after having worked extensively with our allies, is making a number of visits in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Vietnam, and Fiji. Deployments like this one represent a unique opportunity that allows the Royal Canadian Navy to foster and sustain cooperative relationships, the kind of relationship that are critical to ensuring the safety of the sea lanes and the security of our world's oceans. Looking ahead to next year, 2017, We'll be sending two other frigates to the region to continue our presence in the region, and we'll see one of our submarines conduct an extended out of area deployment as well. We'll also be increasing our participation in RIMPAC 2018 with a three warship, uh, a replenisher, and uh, maybe even another boat, as well as we're looking forward to uh, seeing the first uh, operational deployment of our cyclone helicopter, which will replace the venerable uh, and sea. Meanwhile, as the period of modernization comes to a close, we're also looking at the future fleet. Again, uh, I highlight that I had the great pleasure here. I speak to Canadians in uniform here. I just want to uh, highlight for them the great pleasure that it was to work on designing and delivering our future fleet. Critical work for our Navy and uh, its continued relevance into the future. And I uh, commend all of you to consider your service in Ottawa when, when that time comes. Through the government, through the Government of Canada's National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy, we are essentially going through a long-term fleet replacement program. Or replacement program I'm sorry. It's the largest peacetime uh, revitalization of our Navy in its history. This includes replacement of logistics ships, replacement of major surface combatants, and of course the introduction of a new capability in the Arctic Offshore Patrol Ship. The Arctic Offshore Patrol Ship will deliver six ice-capable ships designated as the Harry to Wolf class. The Harry to Wolf class will provide the Royal Canadian Navy ability to operate much further north on a sustained basis in the Canadian Arctic and will allow us to continue to increase uh, Arctic collaboration with the Canadian Coast Guard as well as with the other government, other government departments and our international partners. Meanwhile, in 2019, two Queenston class joint support ships uh, produced just across the Strait of Georgia here in uh, C-SPAN yards, uh, 
for shipyards will replace uh, the Royal Canadian Navy's auxiliary oil and replenishment vessels, which we began decommissioning last year. The new ships will provide core replenishment, limited sea lift capabilities, and support to operations ashore. Uh, meanwhile, as Canada current, currently faces a capability gap owing to the lack of replenishment support until the JSS and Joint Support Ship provides, we'll also begin to see, uh, we'll also soon see industry deliver a provision of these services via uh, a project that we call an interim AOR uh, out of uh, Project Resolve in the MIL Data Yard in, uh, in uh, Quebec City. That project's going to deliver, as I was discussing uh, earlier in the conference, September of 2017, a sustainment capability for the Navy, and one that we'll look to put in the use right away in 2018. Once that ship moves from the Atlantic to the Pacific in late 17, early 18, and we get ready for that major uh, 2018 uh, swing through Asia Pacific. These uh, replenishment ships are critical components for achieving success in both international and domestic missions. The ships constitute a vital and strategic national asset. As the presence of replenishment ships increases, the range and endurance of the naval task group are many to remain at sea for the significant periods of time uh, that it needs to go without replenishment. And as we look further into the future, we are preparing to replace the newly modernized Halifax class frigates with the Canadian surface combatants. Uh, certainly a big focus of our activity by our uh, procurement and uh, requirements teams in Ottawa over this last year. This class will enable the RCN to continue to be able to capable to protect Canadians and Canadian interests, prevent conflict by allowing us to support partner nations and dissuade potential adversaries, and to project Canadian values of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, combining this resume of the state of Canada's maritime forces then, with my premise that we're in an unprecedented maritime era with a uniquely Pacific flavor, I need to conclude by offering that to the Royal Canadian Navy, effectiveness in operation that sea hinges not only on these investments in warships, but also, as I discussed with my colleagues last night over dinner, um, in relationships as well. As Vice Admiral Lloyd would say if he was here, you can't search trust. Instead, it is built through collaborative endeavors, such as time spent on station and in our shared exploration of the battle space through dialogues such as the one that we're going through in this conference. With that in mind, then, ladies and gentlemen, I note that our organizers have built us a splendid conference. As you participate in I'm certain that you'll come to share my belief that there is a strategic nexus to Pacific sea power that illuminates the current oceanic era as unprecedented, making our discussions and debate of the issues we face in Asia Pacific today and tomorrow more germane than ever. Enjoy the conference. I look forward to listening to all of you.